In this study, um, we've been looking at the book of James, and um, the title of the message this morning is, If the Lord Wills. How many of you ever heard that phrase, maybe from your parents or your grandparents or somebody like that, if the Lord wills? Now, if you're from the South, how do we say it? Lord willing. Lord willing. Um, very often we say. Um, and, uh, you know, Lord willing, we'll be able to come back on vacation here. Lord willing, we'll be able to see you next week. Lord willing, I'll, I'll see you there. It's very interesting. Um, that is a common Christian phrase. Um, even more than uh, the commonality of that, it's not, not so much the case in our more secularized society now, but in the Muslim world, uh, it's rather amazing. Marcy and I lived in North Africa. We worked with uh, uh, bringing the gospel to Muslims for about 10 years. And one of the most common phrases that you will hear on the street in any Arab-speaking Arabic speaking country is this phrase, Inshallah. Inshallah. And Inshallah means if God wills. Now, what's funny about that is that if you hear Inshallah, at least in North Africa, it's not really saying if God wills, I will do this or do that. It is a polite way of saying it ain't going to happen. Um, you know, if God wills, you know, I'll do it. It's like, hey, would you like to come work on my car with me? Can you help me work on my car Thursday afternoon? Well, inshallah, well, that means find somebody else to work on the car. Um, that's really the way that works. Um, that's, that's kind of a way of not knowing. But really, um, if you have a serious conversation with a, the average Muslim, even a nominal Muslim, one that's not very theological on what they believe, they have a very high view of God's sovereignty over the, day, the daily acts of life. I mean, they say, well, you know, I'm going to get married, and, and I will have many children, inshallah. I will have many children, if God wills. And I, I will do this, and if God wills. That you often hear that. And sometimes, even in Muslim culture, when you hear of a tragedy, when you hear of a difficulty that is there, there's a, there's a derivative of that phrase that says, well, this is what God has willed. Now, I have to admit to you, after living in that context and seeing that life, sometimes I am concerned that Muslims have a higher view of the sovereignty of God than many Christians. Many Christians who actually have the unadulterated Word of God the 66 books of the canon of God working in the lives of his people from Genesis all the way to Revelation, from eternity past to eternity future. Many Christians who have this word have failed to so see the sovereignty of God in all things. We have very often reduced God down to, we're, we're not sure if he's really in control. We're not really sure if he deserves our full submission. Because the, will he really do this? Will he do, very often in modern day Christianity, we'll say, we would say, will he do what I want? We're more, we're more concerned about getting what we want very often than fulfilling the creator's design and the creator's demand of our lives. And so this morning as we come to this text, it's a very important text for Christians to see. In fact, I was so jealous of Pastor Lucas and Pastor Ben being able to preach the, free, the previous two sermons. Uh, I think Pastor Ben preached uh, the passage that simply says there in James chapter 4, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That is one of the first major concepts that I learned as a 19-year-old that was really starting to walk with God. I remember when I read that. I remember that I thought, wow, God's word promises, as I step toward him, he is stepping toward me. And amidst all of my defeat of my personal life, amidst all of the sin in my life, amidst all of the desire to, to honor him but not being able to do so in my own strength, I started to see that God is at work with me. God is coming and he is stepping toward me. 
And those who step toward the Lord, he is stepping toward them, and he comes and he walks with us. I remember being encouraged by that concept from James 4. And so this morning we come to a second major area uh, in the book of James that affected me as a young man. And this concept that, that uh, Pastor Tommy has, or Tommy has already read has helped me. Let's review the context here a little bit. Review in context at the top of your page. There's, a, there's about 50 words on this sheet front and back that I invite you to fill in. It's just to help you to pay attention. Notice with me, number one there, the letter of James gives several tests to help you determine if you are a true Christian. If you're new to us this morning, you can read the book of James, as we've been studying for the last 30 messages, and you can see that there are tests that are given. The early church already had false Christianity going out. The early church already had religious but ungodly people. And that's what was being um, combated here as the, the pastor James of Jerusalem was writing. Look at number two. This letter has two, this is a new concept for you a little bit, but it's part of the context here. Number two, this letter has two primary functions. A, revealing faulty faith. And I put out there to the side, exposing fake Christians. You say, yeah, let's expose those fake Christians. Well, just make sure you're not one of them. <laughs> Look at letter B. It not only re reveals false, faulty faith, but it also teaches godly wisdom. This is one of the wisdom books of the New Testament. Really, it's the only real wisdom book, wisdom literature of the New Testament. It talks about how to live. How, it's the way of life for true Christians. So there's a, there's a dual function here as you see James rebuke upon the churches spread around the Mediterranean world who are reading this letter. He's saying, hey, Christians don't act like this, but they do act like that. So that is exposing false faith, but also in it, in that, in that exhortation, and sometimes even in that rebuke, Christians can learn the way that true Christians should live. And that's the wisdom of that. Last Sunday, the last two Sundays, this is number three, the last two Sundays, the, these messages revealed the ungodliness of strife and pride. Go back and read it. James is saying, why are you at war with each other? Don't be at war with each other with your Christian brother and your sister, the people that are around you. Also, Pastor Lucas preached, letter B, the gross sin of what? Speaking evil of one another. That is a gross sin. In fact, as Pastor Lucas was preaching that, he, he was so showing what the passage shows, that you're not to rewrite the law of God. You're not to either validate or invalidate the law of God. You cannot do that. And what he's saying here is that speaking evil of one another is like holding yourself higher than God's truth. You are not to do that. We are not to do that. It is a gross sin. That doesn't mean so much disgusting as it means huge, big. It is a gross sin for Christians to speak evil of one another in the context of the church and even in the context of life. But um, there's also some other things that I want you to see here. I want us to read this passage. It's short, so we'll be able to read it, read it a couple of times in the course of this message. But um, I want you to see it again there. James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. In fact, this section goes over into chapter 5, as we'll see in just a moment. But this starts a new section in the book of James, Common Thought, um, through this. But look with me in James chapter 4, verse 13. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist or a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Verse 16. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is what? Evil. Evil. Verse 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, 
For him it is what? Sin. Sin. So let's look and see this. There's a couple of preliminary observations um, that we hear, have here. And, and I, as we study the Bible, I just want you to see, and part of the reason we study in such a way like this is because God's Word is for your daily life, and you can take home God's Word. You can read God's Word. And if you kind of see what we do Sunday after Sunday here as we pick apart and we look carefully at God's Word, you can begin to do that in your own life. And that's part of the preaching of God's Word, not only to declare it here and now and this time, but also to equip you to see how God's Word can be read, how it can be studied, how it can be known and understood through the power of the Holy Spirit and through good academic study. Look with me here, number one. James chapter 4, verse 13, 5, and all the way to chapter 5, verse 12. This could be referred to the sins of the wealthy. We've already seen in the book of James a few months ago that James is rebuking the churches for putting status on some members over other members. We see that there is this idea that a rich man comes into your presence. You remember those messages that we looked at that? The rich man comes into your pres presence, and what do you do with him? You give him a nice seat. You give him a nice place in the, place, in the worship house to, wor to, to worship. But then a poor man would come in, and what would you do? Hey, man, sit down over there. St sit down over there. In fact, as we studied that passage, you say to the wealthy man, sit here, and to the poor man, sit beside my footstool. Not even on my footstool, sit beside my footstool. And James was rebuking that as woefully ungodly. James was saying, look, the things of this world do not provide status before God and before God's people. In fact, some of the poor among you are some of the most godly we see in, in many areas of Scripture that sometimes in their poverty, the poor look only to God and not to other things. So we, we see this beautiful leveling and this beautiful rebuke in that. And here we see a passage from chapter 4, verse 13, where we begin today, all the way for the next couple of messages. We see a little bit of a, of a tendency here to deal with the wealthy. And it's the wealthy that very often may be tempted to do what this passage is warning against, that you're going to go into a city, you're just going to say, well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. Because your wealth and your status in the world and because the things that you touch seem to turn to gold and that could provide you earthly status, you could be finding yourself in the position of depending upon yourself far more than you depend upon God. So notice this, today's message is their arrogant presumption. That's the first one there. Or perhaps it's their robbing of the poor, which we'll see in the next week. And then perhaps it's the need for patience and suffering, because very often we would say, well, the wealthy don't suffer as much as the poor, and, and that often is the case. There are some things that earthly wealth can insulate you from, but here we see that the sins of the wealthy are before us in this. Now that said, number two is very important, that said, Anyone and everyone, all capitals please, anyone and everyone can have these sinful mindsets. You don't have to be rich to have these mindsets that are warned here. Anyone and everyone can. In fact, we need to be careful. Notice the next statement here. Don't excuse yourself from the rebuke and instruction of God's Word. I want to encourage you as a Bible reader... As someone who reads the Word of God, when you come across something that you say, there, don't, don't say to yourself, oh, I've got that down. I'm not like that. That's a very unwise position to be in. In fact, Jesus told of two men praying there in the temple. One man stood proud and said, Lord, I thank you that I am not like this tax collector over here. Thank you, Lord. That, but what did the tax collector do? He went down and he beat on his breast and he said, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. I want you to see that Jesus says in that day, whose prayer did God listen to? It's the humble man. And so I just want to say to you that it is a dangerous thing to exempt yourself from rebukes in the word of God. The wise man says at every turn, Lord, I think this applies to me. 
Um, you see, some, some might say, well, I'm glad I'm not proud. Um, I've been given the gift of humility. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm not like everybody else in this. Um, so thankful for that, and I'm so thankful my church has me as a good resource here in the life of the church because I'm so humble. Um, you know, it, that's part of the picture that is here, that we should not live in the arrogant way of excusing ourselves from God's Word. Pastor th James, in number three, Pastor James shifts from a focus on external relationships, and that's what last week Pastor Lucas was dealing with, the external relationships of speaking ill with, with one another to an internal mindset that we see today. So there's the external and the internal um, relationships to the mindset. This is a pattern throughout God's Word. God continually deals with both the inner person and the outer person. They are inextricably linked together. You cannot separate the inner man from the outer man as we see God's Word. Now, very often, cultural Christianity just focuses on the outer self. That you look good, you, you sound good, you do the right things on the outside, you know, you, you, you go to church, you, you're, you're seeking to raise your kids right, you're seeking to have, you know, you're seeking to be a good Christian family. Well, those are good things to do. It's good to go to church. It's good to, it's good to seek to be a, a Christian family that lives by... But let me tell you, that that without heart issue, that without heart submission is just a facade. It's just a charade. God is interested in the heart. He is interested in us living our Christianity before Him in brokenness, in the quiet person of your own self, in the quiet place of your own marriage together before the Lord as the only hope. And you can have that if you will just simply say, Lord, we want to be humble together as a family. We, I want to be humble before you as myself. This is how you spend time with God. You allow God's Word to speak to you. When you begin to slack off on your Christian disciplines, when you begin to not do what you know you should do, as this passage in 17 talks about, that's when your intimacy with the Lord will begin to fail. That's when there will become a growing space between you and the Lord. That's when you will become more of a charade than a true, genuine follower and worshiper of Jesus. That's why it's important for you to be in God's Word daily. That's why it's important for you to spend time in prayer, for you to develop the discipline of not only being in God's Word and in prayer, but as you're doing here, being on a rainy summer Sunday morning. I'm proud of that. This is part of the discipline of seeking to walk with God. That's a good thing. May we continue to see that he deals with the outer person and the inner person. Number four, another preliminary thought on this is the unconverted are admonished or rebuked for their godless thinking in this passage. Part of this, James is aiming at the false Christians in the church, and he's, he's seeking yet again to expose how they are ungodly. Um, you will notice here that it's not talking, he doesn't address brothers uh, in these verses that are right here. He doesn't, he doesn't say brothers in this. This could be part of the passage that is really aimed at those in the church that do not have faith in Christ. While, notice this, that the converted, the converted those who are Christians, are instructed in how they ought to think in view of, in their think and view with their lives. Um, so we want to we want to see that very clearly. Now flip your sheet over. It's safe to do that. Notice here with me. Um, you may want to put below this box um, that is here a side note. This is not on the projectors or on your outline. But this is not a text against planning. This is not a scripture that is saying that planning is bad. In fact, we see throughout the scriptures, uh, the whole message of the Bible is it is a good thing to be someone who plans ahead. That's not, that's not what's in question here. Uh, it's, not, it's not a bad thing to save. It's not a bad thing to work out a, a business plan. It's not a bad thing to consult others and, and see uh, what the possibilities would be for a businessman as he is seeking to start a new business or engage in business. That is not a bad thing. That's not being held in question. 
The problem is when you do that and you make plans without God. The problem is when you do that from a position of self-sufficiency instead of a dependency upon God. You see, that's an ungodly way to look at life. So let's read the passage even again. There at the top of your page, look what it says in verse 13. He says, come now, you who say. So now he's directing attention to particular people. He's saying, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Is there anything wrong with doing any of those things? There's nothing wrong with that. I know that in our present culture right now, political, cultural idea, profit is bad. No, it's not. I mean, God has made us in a world that involves uh, life and involves needs and involves money. There's nothing wrong with making a profit. Um, there's, in fact, if you're a business owner, you say, well, we can't stay in business if we don't make a profit. I have to do that. As, as someone who works, there's nothing wrong with you going and working in your job for the city or the county or the hospital or whatever it is in making a profit. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's the way the world works and the way God um, has encouraged us to work in this. So there's nothing wrong with anything in verse 13 except... Look at verse 14. He says, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now here's the instruction and here's the difference in verse 15. Instead, circle the word instead. Because here comes the difference. Here comes the difference that we're called to embrace. Instead, you ought to say, and then underline it, if the Lord wills. And then notice what he says after that. We will live. Circle the word live. <laughs> We're going to see here that even the basic necessity of life comes under the sovereignty of God. And then it says, and do this or that. Verse 16, as it is, you, uh, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Verse 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Some key observations that I want you to see this morning. Number one, it is possible to leave God out of your plans and decisions. Yes, it's possible for you to do that. You can leave God out. In fact, for many people, that is their total default. Either they leave God out out of ignorance or they leave God out out of outright rebellion because they're afraid that God doesn't want what they want. And so in the decisions of business or in the decisions of family or in the decisions of life, we say, no, 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 wait a minute. We, we, I know what I want. And so I'm going to go after what I want instead of after what God wants. Instead of living as one who submits to God's plan, we, we say, well, I want what I want. And I'm going to pursue what I want. So sometimes it's a fear that God is not going to give what I want. God is not going to bless my desire. God is going to have a different plan, and I don't want God's plan. So whatever all the reasons are that you may do it, either out of ignorance, not knowing that you're called to allow God into these decisions and look to him, sometimes either ignorance or outright rebellion that comes from selfishness or fear, a lack of faith, we often leave God out. Now, this, and we see that in verse 13, there's no mention of God, look at the top of the page, there's no mention of God in that passage. Today, it's all about what we are going to do, what I am going to do. We're going to go to such and such a town. We're going to, we even determine how much time it's going to take. We're going to spend that time there, and we're going to trade. We're going to be able to make trade, and we're going to be able to make profit. So it's all about what we are going to do. Now, underneath number one, notice here, this is secular life. You see, this is life without God. This is the world's way. This is the way the world operates. This is the way your friends 
This is the way your colleagues, this is the way your family members who don't know God think. Christians are not to think this way. Christians are not to live in that possibility of making their decisions and making their plans without God. We, we are not to act like that. We are to act in a different way, even though this is the way the majority of the people around it. If you say, well, do most people pray before they decide to go buy that car? Or do most people pray before they decide to move from one city to another? Do most people pray before they decide to take that other job or before they decide to move their kids from this school to this school? I mean, do most people? No, most people don't pray about these things. They're just looking at it, and they're looking at kind of what they want, or they're looking at their pain, or they're looking at their own issues, and they're deciding what they're going to do. Or the circumstances of life force them in to making decisions, and there they are suddenly, impulsively making decisions on their own, not truly looking to God. So, and I'm not talking about trite prayers of, oh Lord, give me what I want, give me what I want, Lord, I want to do this, would you please bless it? True Christians say, no, I have an interactive relationship with God of the Word, of the, of the Scripture that tells me everything I, that I need to know in Him, and I am seeking Him and His Word. I am praying, looking to Him in His Spirit, and I am listening to what He says and asking for His guidance, and by faith, looking to Him in this time. See, there's a very big difference in the way the world makes decisions and the way Christians are to make decisions. Number two. Not only is it possible, but number two, it is foolish to leave God out of your plans and decisions. It's simply foolish. It doesn't make sense for you to do this. And that's what this passage is pointing out. In verse 14, we see it doesn't make sense. Look at verse 14 with me, if you would, right there on your outline. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You see, he's saying, it doesn't even make sense for you to act like this. It doesn't make sense for you to make decisions like this. Why? Number one, you don't know the future. You don't even know, not even tomorrow do you know the future. You don't even know, you don't even know tomorrow, much less next year. Look at the next part there. Your earthly life is limited, unknown, and it's going to what? pass away. That's what we see in this passage. He describes our lives as a vapor, as a mist. Now, he's not saying that you are worthless. He's just simply saying that your life in this earthly life is very, very transitory. It is, it is very temporary. It, it is not going to go on. You are not immortal. You are mortal. And he gives this incredibly temporary image of a vapor. Now, I was going to have a really hot cup of coffee up here and take the lid off of it. And if I did that, and if I took the lid off a very hot cup of coffee, what would you see? You'd see a little bit of a steam. Would, would it go all the way to the ceiling? No. About how far would it go? Depending on the humidity in this room, it would probably go about that far. And you would just see it rise up as the heat is heating the air over the cup of coffee. It would, be, it would be rising, and it would dissipate. It would be a little vapor that would last for just a few seconds, and it would be gone. You say, wow, is that God's view of my life? Is it, I'm just a vapor that's here for a few seconds and then gone? In some ways, yes. Your earthly life in the course of all of history is just a little vapor that is here for a while and and then gone very quickly. But notice that Jesus died for that little vapor of your life. That's how much Jesus cares about you and about me. These little insignificant lives that are so short and so powerless and so weak and so temporary, the God of the universe who created all things leaves heaven and comes to earth not only as a king, but also as a suffering servant. And he dies on the cross for the little vapor of our lives. So before you think that God doesn't have a very high view of you, remember what he did to save you when he gives himself that you might live. 
So this little vapor is not unimportant. It's very important. It just doesn't make sense to think that you're immortal and that everything is here and now. In fact, it's so much more. Notice the next bullet point, the third one there on the bottom. You don't even know if you're going to be alive, much less make a profit. You don't, you, there are no guarantees for tomorrow. There have been people over the last 55 years in this church who have been sitting in a service and had a heart attack. Now, to my knowledge, no one has died in this room. But it's possible. I know people who have churches where somebody has dropped dead while in church. Now, that'd be a great place to go and a great way to go. Worshiping the Lord, boom, you're gone. You're with the Lord. Well, Lord, I left the worship service, you know, and I'm here now. I mean, you know, that, that wouldn't be bad. But we are not guaranteed another moment. We're not guaranteed that we're going to make it out of this, this day. Let me tell you that while Barbara has suffered for a long time, when I left for vacation, Edward seemed to be fine. And, and now we see. We don't know. I mean, he was having a little bit of trouble breathing, calls the doctor. Hey, I don't feel good. I kind of have shortness of breath. Go see the doctor. The doctor says, go to the emergency room. Let's do the scans. Oh, it could be pneumonia. could be bronchitis. We're not sure. Let's, let's get the fluid out. Let's test the fluid. Let's do the blood work. Let's do the urinalysis. Let's do it all. Let's see what, what's, what's going on here doctor comes in and says, Edward, you have cancer. You see, our lives are a vapor. We don't know what is next week. We don't know what is next month. We don't know what is next year. And as Christians, we don't live in that way in fear, but as Christians, we have the opportunity to live in that way in faith of saying, there's one who does. There's one who knows not only what's in my next coming days, weeks, months, years, but there's one who knows what is in my eternity. Amen. And so we see that it doesn't make sense for us to make plans without God. Not only is it possible to leave God out and foolish to leave God out, but number three, it is sinful to leave God out of your plans and your decisions. It's not just optional for the Christian. Well, you know, I, I could be a Christian who does this, and I might be a Christian who doesn't do this, or on this I will, but on that I won't. No, we need to understand that it's not amoral. It is immoral to leave God out. It's, it's not just... If you feel like it, but notice here in verse 16 and 17. Notice at the top of the page, verse 16 and 17. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is, circle it, what? Evil. Evil. So whoever, does, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is what? It is sin. Now, Pastor Lucas's sermon, when it was talking about speaking evil of one another, there's elaborate language during the previous passage from last week about talking about how sinful it is to speak evil of one another, talking about the law. But here we see, in another way, James is showing us that this too is sinful. Look at verse 16. You boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So let's, let's not be confused about this. Let's be very clear about this. And you can see it on the screen in front of you. Verse 16 is saying all such boasting is evil. evil. Verse 17 is saying it is sin to leave God out of your plans and your decisions. You see, leaving God out of your plans and decisions, fill this in, um, out of your thinking is arrogant and prideful. And that's what this verse says in verse 16. It is arrogant. 
And God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But this isn't one who's going to receive God's grace because he is living in arrogant pride. Look at the next one that is here. <clears throat> it reveals a lack of faith and submission to God when we do that. And this is evil. You see, a lack of faith is sinful. A lack of faith is evil. Romans 14, verse 23 says, whatever is not of faith is what? Is sin. We are called as God's children to walk in dependence upon him, to walk in submission to him, to walk in obedience to him. And when we don't do that, it is truly sinful. Now, um, I, I think of this passage and I, I look at um, the arrogant wrench man from Luke chapter 12. And you just look at this passage. It's important enough that I've printed it on the page for you to see this biblical example in the message. Look at verse 16. This is Jesus speaking about the arrogant rich man. Look at verse 16. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And it's, notice there, it's not the rich man produced plentifully. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. Verse 17. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. Verse 18, and he said, I will do this. Underline that. I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger lawns, bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat drink and be merry. Jesus said, verse 20, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Verse 21, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself, underline it, and is not rich toward God. You see, God calls his children to be rich toward him, rich in faith, rich in trust, rich in following and obedience to him. Is your family rich toward God or are you just rich toward yourselves? God calls us to be this. Now, this arrogance and prideful, there, there's two huge examples of this that I see in human history. And uh, this isn't on your outline, but I do want you to see some images that are here. There's two huge examples, prominent examples. And let me tell you that there are millions, there are millions of examples of pride and independence from God. But these are just two that as I was studying, I thought about. The first one is this one, the Tower of Babel. Do you remember that what they said back there in Genesis chapter 11? They said, we are going to build what? A tower. And it's going to be a monument to what? To God? No. If you go back and you read the account, they said, we're going to build a tower. And it's going to be a monument to ourselves. So everybody who comes after us will see how great we were. What did God do with the Tower of Babel? He stopped it mid-construction. He, he diffused the group, and he sent them out. You see, they weren't going out as they were told to do in Genesis 1, 2, 1 and 2 to, to spread out and subdue the earth. That's for God's glory. They were cloistering together. They were coming together, and they were going to build their own tower. They were not doing what God had told them to do. And so in their coming together, they were going to make a name great for themselves. And God said, no, you're not. And so he, he gave them different languages. They could not work together. And that is when they began to spread out and do what he told them to do originally. Well, there's another more modern day example of pride and independence from God. Do you know what this one is? Here, here's, a, here's a great example of relatively modern history. Um, the, the RMS Titanic. 
the, the, the glorious ship that was just long, almost beyond what you could see on the promenade deck. The opulence and the wealth that was within it. And it sets off on April the 10th on its maiden voyage, leaving Ireland and going to New York. And as they were pulling out, there was a lot of talk. Captain Edward Smith and naval architect Thomas Andrews said, this ship is what? Unsinkable. They had bulkheads that they had designed, seven bulkheads within it. So they said, if one compartment fills with water, no problem. The doors are going to shut. Very easy. We have the protocols. We've made a ship that is unsinkable. There was one lady who was scared to get aboard the boat that day that it was leaving, she and her husband. And um, her name, uh, notice here, was Mrs. Albert Caldwell. But one of the ship's porters said to her on April the 10th in 1912, she said, Madame, not even God can sink the RMS Titanic. Pride and arrogance. Notice they leave on April the 10th, and by the 15th, Far out there in the Atlantic, the ship strikes an iceberg, and this artist's rendering is beautiful. And the reason I chose to use these, these couple of images that are here is because notice the condition of the water. What is the condition of the sea? Dead calm. They said it was like glass. It was a, the ocean was a mirror that night. The visibility was perfect. There was, there was no wind. There was no waves. There was no current that caused this. It was man's stupidity that caused this. Steaming ahead, they strike the huge iceberg that is there. It rips open several compartments down the side of the ship. And within two hours and 20 minutes... The ship sinks. And today, there's a beautiful monument on the bottom of the Atlantic. It's a monument to man's stupidity and arrogance and pride. This is looking in the portals along the side. One, one that promenade deck that we saw a few minutes ago, this is that promenade deck now with one submersible shining light in the side. And even the glorious staterooms that they would find many things left just as they were. In fact, one with a, a glass that was sitting next to the sink. And the glass, strangely enough, is still sitting right there next to the sink, as if to say, no. Madame, you're wrong. Or Porter, you're wrong. God can sink this ship. Now, I just want you to say that the arrogance and pride that humanity is capable of is dishonoring to God. And it is not the way of God's children. We see in these passages that God has called us to live in faith in Him and not in arrogance. I want you to see verse or number four here on the bottom. True Christians will True Christians will live very aware of God's sovereignty over all things and make their plans and decisions in humble, glad, active submission to his will. You see, this is the Christian life. We see a lot in the Bible that describes the way Christians act, or the way God's people act. Now, there's two ways to say this. Christians will do this right above the word will, should. Because we see in James' wisdom literature that this is the way to live. But we see also in James' rebuke is that this is the way Christians will live. He's saying to us that true faith has, has works. True faith has results. Jesus said, the tree is known by its fruit. And so, if you're a Christian, you're going to act like a Christian. That's part of James's big point. 
And so Christians are called to live in this way. And true Christians will live in this way. Look at verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and we will do that. That word ought is the idea of should. And James's whole point is, is that this is the way Christians live. Now, underneath number four, you see there that James reveals it's all about having a mindset of faith and obedience. A mindset of faith and obedience. That Christians not only believe, but they obey. In fact, I've given one example here, and this is just on the screen, that this was Paul's mindset. I want you to see these two passages from Acts and 1 Corinthians. Look what Paul would say. When Paul was departing from Ephesus, he said, but as he left them, the, the book of Acts says, but as he left them, he said, I will return to you, what? If God wills. And he set sail for Ephesus. Look at 1 Corinthians 4.19. He is rebuking the church. And he says to them, as in the midst of that rebuke, I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And he goes on to say, to see who's prideful. And to see who's walking with God and not walking with God. Who's honoring God and who's not honoring God. He said, I'm going to come if God wills. And I'm going to live that way and see you. Here we see not only did Paul think that way, but I want you to see that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, lived this example in his earthly life before he went to the cross for us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night before he would be executed for the sins of the world, look what it says in Luke chapter 2, or 22, verse 41, either on the screen or on your outline. Look what it says in verse 41. And he withdrew from them, talking about the disciples, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. <laughs> Here it is. Read it out loud together with me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, I want you to see in this passage that the second person of the Trinity, the Son, in submission to the Trinity, in submission to himself and the Father, he comes to the earth to fulfill the will of God. And even he would come and say, Nevertheless, not my earth. This beautiful dynamic of person to person within the Trinity, we see this glorious nature of the Godhead. Listen to this. Here's the point out of it. Giving himself for us. And that giving himself was not without pain. There are some Christian traditions and denominations in the world that would say, oh, well, Jesus never really suffered pain. Jesus was never really tempted. Jesus never, I mean, the, he was God. He, would, you know, he wouldn't do that. I've even heard that within this, after a message or two, there were some who have come to me and said, well, well did, did Jesus, did it really smell in the manger area? I mean, what, that was God coming down to earth, and he was born in a horse. I mean, wasn't the hay super soft, non-allergenic hay? Wasn't it just perfect for him? And the idea is no. No. He was tempted, but he never sinned. He did feel the pain. And not only did he feel the pain of being mocked and beaten and, and spit upon and nails pressed down on his, on his skull, his arms stretched out as he's whipped, removing the flesh from his back and sides and torso. But we also see that in great agony of sin being laid on his shoulder, he would say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As within the Trinity, we see this great agony in saving the world from its sin. 
And so even in that, we see Jesus, the Son, say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I want you to see here as you fill in the last part, seeking and submitting to God's will may not be easy, but it is eternally worth it. Circle the word eternally. Because you see, friends, true Christians are not called to live for this earthly life, but for eternity. And this makes car wrecks and bankruptcy and disappointment and cancer worth it as we live in faith to God. Now, as many of you are already doing, go ahead and pack up and then just look at me. I might give you a second. Pack up and then we're have everybody settle down. Do you make plans and decisions as a Christian? Or do you make plans and decisions as somebody from the world? Do you submit your plans and your decisions to God and ask for Him to guide you? Or are you really good at just calling the shots yourself? How do you do that? I believe that you spend time in prayer. I believe that you spend time in God's Word. I believe that you call others around you to pray with you as you make decisions. I believe that you seek wise counsel. That's how Christians are to make decisions. Not in the vacuum of yourself, but in the glorious wisdom of the one who made you he knows the future, and he knows what's best. You see, we can be very deceived about the things in front of us. We can think it's going to be great, and we can think we're going to go after it, and we don't see all of the hidden dangers that are there. Christians are called to depend upon God, all of their decisions and all of their plans. Would you stand with me for prayer?